I was really surprised to hear this. Roughly 90% of the world consumes caffeine on a daily basis. I can't think of anything else in that category. Food, water. And I can say from experience that the topic of caffeine can be quite polarizing. On StrengthSide, we've posted quite a few videos mentioning our use of coffee and some responses are strongly worded. But if anything negative is mentioned about caffeine, then people are quick to respond with research and anecdotes. The FDA says that up to 400 milligrams of caffeine a day could not only not be bad for you, it could even be good for you. But there's all this research that shows that it affects many things in our body negatively. So how does that work? For most of us, it's an integral part of kickstarting our days getting through mundane tasks, or bringing optimism in a world that feels empty sometimes. And for those of us who exercise, caffeine has short-term positive effects on many key markers for performance. But I also want to acknowledge that there's almost no research on the long-term effects of caffeine and performance. And to me, this type of research is highly needed with the use of pre-workout supplements becoming ubiquitous, especially when teens and young adults are having mass amounts of these things with almost no understanding of what it actually does to their bodies. So let's get real about caffeine. 90% of us are addicted and most of us don't even care. Is it really helping us? Or have we given up our autonomy for a quick jolt in the morning, getting us over the hump or getting us through a grueling workout? Let's talk about it. As of this very moment, I am five weeks into sobriety. No caffeine. I do this intermittently throughout the year. Take a small break from coffee when I notice I'm craving that second cup too often. But this time I decided to do longer. I think because if I'm being honest with myself, a week is pretty easy, but I wasn't sure I could really do longer. And it's like, do I really want to be a slave to this thing? I've always considered coffee as a very positive part of my life. I typically make a pour over in the morning as part of my morning routine, and I drink it as I journal, write scripts for YouTube videos, chat with friends, or just listen to music and ponder life. All of these things seemingly enhanced by caffeine. Then I take that caffeinated state to the gym and crush a long workout. So I decided for this video, I'm gonna have my first cup of coffee right now as I'm recording this. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm pretty stoked. And everyone I talk to agrees. Caffeine gives you the inspiration to feel like you can tackle anything. The clear headedness and optimism are tried and true benefits. And these benefits have been around for ages and they potentially help shape the world as we know it today. The introduction of coffee into the Middle East in the 16th century and Europe in the 18th century gave rise to the sacred gathering spaces we still frequent today, the coffee shop. These were places of free conversation, accessible to all, and were the birthplace to new ideas that helped create the world we know today. Ever heard of the Enlightenment? Time where philosophers and scientists placed value on internal logic and reason over external authorities like the church and state. Yeah, I'd say coffee does that to me too. And this was especially true in Europe, where prior to coffee, the only meeting space was the pub. In the American Civil War, the Union soldiers were rationed 36 pounds of coffee a year, whereas the Confederate South would go months with no coffee at all. And if you're not from the US, you could take a guess on how that one turned out. All right, first pour, gotta get the bloom. The Industrial Revolution came into its full form at the invention of something else we still hold sacred, the coffee break. Prior to the coffee break, workers would clock out for their meals and not get paid. But it was normal for workers to eat five small meals a day, which led to workers and employees missing out on precious work time. Some savvy businessmen realized if they supply coffee for their workers, the workers would take less time on breaks, take less breaks altogether because they'd be less hungry, and of course, were far more productive throughout the day, which points out the most common reason we all like caffeine. Whether you're working on an assembly line, sitting down to write code, working construction, you name it, caffeine makes mundane tasks far more tolerable, or even potentially enjoyable. Coffee, tea, and chocolate, all natural sources of caffeine, were among the top cash crops throughout most of modern history, up there with tobacco, sugar, cotton, and wheat. This is obviously because of the glaring benefits of caffeine. Enhanced focus, alertness, energy, feelings of optimism, even euphoria. 
I'm about to get some of that euphoria right now. So if the ingestion of caffeine was so important historically, get this, prolific writer and philosopher Voltaire would drink 40 to 50 cups a day. Then what's the problem? All right, here we go. Oh, it smells so good. Oh, dang. Regular caffeine use can affect your electrolyte balance, which makes for the easiest segue to the sponsor of this video, Element. I was using Element Electrolyte Mix far before they became a sponsor. They are the gold standard for electrolyte supplements, not only because they use an evidence-based formulation and they don't have any dodgy ingredients, but finally, someone got the taste right. I personally drink half a packet with my morning coffee. Well, for the last month, it's been herbal teas. And then I drink the other half during my morning workout to replace everything I lose through sweat. And right now we've got a special offer. If you click the link in the description box, you can get a free sample pack with any purchase. And get this, low levels of electrolytes can actually contribute to more anxiety and stress, which brings us back to, well, I'm sure everyone watching this video at some point has had a bit too much caffeine and felt the shaky, heart racing, anxiety filled misery of a caffeine overdose. And this points out much of the inherent problem with caffeine. It's quite literally a delivery mechanism for stress. Caffeine blocks adenosine receptors and adenosine is kind of like the babysitter for our brains. It's there to make sure we don't destroy the house or ourselves and to make sure we go to bed on time. Elevated adenosine dampens neuron firing in the brain, and it makes us feel sleepy because we need to sleep. Well, when caffeine blocks adenosine from binding to its receptors, we get a cascade of events. First, no more sleepiness. But another main outcome is elevated adrenaline. In a 16 ounce coffee, you can get over 200% increase in adrenaline. This leads to poor digestion, elevated blood pressure, heart rate, sweating, basically all the stuff that would happen during exercise without the exercise. And I mean, once in a while, this is fine. But if you're drinking caffeine throughout the day, every day, these effects take a big toll on your body, especially your sleep. And to me, sleep is the scariest thing that caffeine affects. Research shows that people who drink 250 milligrams of caffeine a day have poor sleep quality. But plenty of people, myself included, who are addicted to caffeine don't necessarily have insomnia. If anything, you're probably quite tired in the evenings, but the half-life of caffeine is slow, anywhere from three to 12 hours, depending on the individual. So although you feel tired, you still probably have some caffeine in your blood. And if you have any caffeine in your system while you're sleeping, then you're likely getting little to no deep sleep, which is potentially the most important stage of your sleep cycles. This is why you may wake up and not feel completely refreshed. And so you reach for more caffeine. And here's a list of the most common consequences of chronic sleep deprivation. Hypertension, diabetes, depression, heart attack, stroke. These sound familiar? That's because they're some of the most common illnesses and causes of death in the Western world. Not to mention some of the more short-term effects. Memory issues, poor concentration, reduced self-control, mood swings, all things that caffeine can fix for us. But wait, isn't caffeine why we're here in the first place? Oh, and maybe worst of all, sleep deprivation puts us in a catabolic state. Just one night of bad sleep. So now we're losing gains. There's even some compelling evidence that caffeine can make us less empathetic. It narrows our field of focus, making us hyper effective, but less likely to see a problem from multiple perspectives. And this can obviously affect our personal life greatly. With all these negatives, and trust me, I barely skim the surface. Will you ever have caffeine again? Well, I know I will, because for me, I know if I stick to lower amounts and use it for performance in work or in sport, then the positives outweigh the negatives. And there are some serious benefits when it comes to sport and exercise. Let's take a look. Woo! 
I feel good. Forget caffeine's a drug. The rise of pre-workout supplements has been meteoric. Product Orange was the first of its kind in 1982, and in 2019, it was already a $12.6 billion industry. And for good reason, they're effective. They make people train hard. Whether it's a pre-workout or just some coffee, caffeine makes it far easier to start and finish your workout. Physiologically, it can help you last longer during endurance workouts. There's even some evidence that shows it could help you lift more weight, but the research is debated. I could sit here and cite a bunch of research, but let's be honest, most of us have experienced it. Caffeine is sick for workouts. But here lies the issue. 90% of us have caffeine on a daily basis. We have a tolerance. So to get the physiological performance benefits, we'd actually have to have more caffeine than we're used to. And statistically, over 50% of us work out in the afternoon or evening, meaning you'd have to have a big serving of caffeine fairly late in the day, only perpetuating that poor sleep cycle we talked about earlier. Not to mention the research on caffeine and performance is quite muddled. Because 90% of us are addicted to caffeine, it's hard to parse out what results are actually from a benefit from caffeine versus the control group who doesn't get any caffeine, just having caffeine withdrawals. Oh, and a majority of the research on caffeine and performance uses really high amounts of caffeine, three to six milligrams per kilogram of body weight, which is highly caffeinated for most people. Even most pre-workouts don't use that much caffeine. And for those of you thinking, well, there's way more to pre-workouts than just caffeine. Don't get me started. Just a bit of research on the main ingredients other than stimulants in pre-workouts, citrulline malate, creatine, beta alanine, are severely underdosed. Oh, and creatine and beta alanine don't even have any short-term effects. They need to be taken daily. So stop wasting money on these scam artists. So if the performance benefits are iffy, then what the hell are we all experiencing when we see the clear benefits of caffeine on our workouts? After doing tons of research, consuming tons of caffeine, and talking with all kinds of people about this topic, I think that the most potent effect of caffeine on our workouts is actually just a reduction in perceived pain. It makes us feel, in a way, like a superhero. We're able to push ourselves far past what we could normally do with relative ease. But it's not because of anything physiological. We're probably not getting more oxygen to our muscles or contracting our muscles harder or anything like that. It's just that our mind can literally tolerate more pain. It's basically the same effect that it has on our work. We're just able to endure more and hate it less or maybe even enjoy it. Whew, this coffee's good starting to feel it. If you've watched Strength Side before, you know that our priorities of working out are a bit different. Flexibility is something we value just as high as anything else. And the idea of less pain while you're stretching is huge. For most people, stretching is not limited by the body itself, but by our minds. It's literally the pain that stops us. The literature is pretty sparse in this field, but there are a few studies that show significant increases in flexibility just from ingestion of caffeine. And we can imagine the compounding effect of being able to endure stretches for longer and more often because of caffeine than the long-term effects can be easily imagined. And I can say I've definitely experienced them personally. And for those of us who are interested in caloric restriction, caffeine has been clearly shown to reduce appetite for a window of about four hours. This has clear utility if you're trying to eat a smaller breakfast or do intermittent fasting, where in this scenario, you would just skip breakfast altogether. Now, this may not come for free. Eating less earlier in the day, even from caffeine use, may make you hungrier later in the day. So the jury's still out on the link between caffeine and weight loss. So. Do your own research, experiment on yourself, and talk to a professional who knows what they're doing. Now that I've made this as confusing as possible for you, let me throw one more wrench in. Moderate coffee or tea intake has been shown to decrease overall mortality. Meaning, if you have a bit of coffee or tea on a regular basis, you're less likely to die. But as of now, the research is only correlational. But scientists are working hard to understand the potential causes. Uh, 
I miss coffee. Especially considering the negative effects we talked about earlier. Some clear health benefits that have been documented thus far are reduced risks of some types of cancer, protection against degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, and lower rates of depression. But some critics say the research is tainted. I mean, if you add up the revenue sales from coffee, tea, caffeinated beverages, and caffeinated supplements, then we're looking at nearly a half a trillion dollar industry. So who's to say money hasn't swayed some research in a particular direction? I mean, we all know the story of the food pyramid, right? Okay, tin foil hat removed. Here are some take homes I'd like to leave you with today. Number one, know what your relationship is to caffeine and understand moderate caffeine intake for you. We all know that alcohol is bad for us physiologically, but there's more to health than just our bodies. What we gain from occasional moderate alcohol use in our relationships, in our worldview, in our hearts, can greatly outweigh the negative. So if we think of caffeine as we do alcohol, we can make a conscious transaction between the negatives and the positives. We can create a balance in our lives that's net positive but we have to be actively engaged in the process. So when you notice your tolerance going up, take a quick caffeine deload. A week or two off can do the trick. Number two, if you plan to use caffeine for its performance benefits in the gym or in sport, then you may not wanna use it every day. Save it for the days that you really wanna crush it. Number three, and I really wish I could just put this at number one, don't have it too late in the day. More and more research keeps piling up that sleep is so, so important. It's the easiest way to affect your health positively. So to prioritize sleep, try not to have caffeine past the afternoon. Number four, stop letting kids have caffeine. This one is crazy to me. We're making little addicts before their brains are even fully developed. Caffeine is a drug. We shouldn't just give kids drugs flippantly. So this means sodas, energy drinks, basically, basically everything you can buy at a convenience store has caffeine these days. Plus, a lot of the benefits that researchers find are on coffee and tea, not synthetic caffeine, which is what's in most energy drinks, sodas, those types of products. So keep your caffeine natural. And finally, if you're truly curious about what role caffeine plays in your life, take a long break, something like three to six weeks. You may find that you don't need it. And if you want to learn more about the topic, Michael Pollan has an exclusive audiobook. It's only two hours called Caffeine. It's easy listening and quite informational. All right, in all sincerity, if you like this video, please let us know. This is a new style video for us on StrengthSide and it was really fun to make, but it also took a lot of work. I read four books and dozens of research articles and talked to so many people about this topic all to make this video. And I'd love to make more of them. So let us know in the comment section what you liked about this video. Tell us a little bit about your relationship to caffeine. Subscribe to StrengthSide. We'll see you in the next video. Ooh, I feel high.